What's going on everyone? I'm Amedio602 and today I'm going to tell you how to get the Platinum Trophy in Remnant from the Ashes. That elusive Platinum Trophy is the 41st trophy in Remnant from the Ashes. To earn that Platinum Trophy you're going to need to unlock the other 40 trophies. Of course this guide isn't limited to just PlayStation players. Whether you're playing on Xbox, PC, or PlayStation, don't worry, I've got you covered. When I'm finished describing all the trophies, I'm going to give you some general strategies for the game, so feel free to skip ahead to the end of the video if you're interested in those. You can expect to spend anywhere between 30 to 40 hours to earn this Platinum, and it's important to know that none of these trophies depend on the difficulty. Jumping right into the good stuff, there are 20 what I would call freebie trophies. These are trophies you're going to earn just by going through and playing the game. Just as long as you complete the campaign and you're working toward all of the other trophies, you're going to come across these. The only trophy on this list that you are not guaranteed to get is Heart of a Dragon. In order to get that trophy, you're going to need to take a Simulacrum to the Root Mother and exchange it for an extra Dragon Heart. But there's pretty much no way you're going to be completing the game with only one Dragon Heart. So that's why I put this one into the freebie category, even though it's not strictly a freebie. And while we're talking about the Simulacrum, there is one Simulacrum available in each world. You can use the Simulacrums that you find to increase the number of Dragon Hearts you have. The Dragon Heart, by the way, is the main healing item in Remnant from the Ashes. It's kind of like an Estus Flask if you're familiar with Dark Souls. You can also use the Simulacrum to upgrade a weapon or piece of armor to the maximum level. So in under a minute and a half, I've already told you how to get half the trophies in the game. This is the perfect time to subscribe to the channel if you're not already, and smash that like button if you're enjoying the video up to this point. Next, I'm going to cover the trophies that are found on specific worlds in the game, and there are going to be some minor spoilers, so spoiler alert. If you're not into that sort of thing and you haven't finished the campaign yet, now might be a good time to bookmark the video so you can come back to it once you finish the campaign. The first world is called Earth, and there are five trophies to find on Earth. There's a trophy called This Watch, which is to acquire Mudtooth's Pocket Watch. Mudtooth is a non-playable character, and Mudtooth is pretty easy to find if he spawns into your game. It's definitely worth pointing out that Remnant from the Ashes has procedural world generation, and that's just a fancy way to say that whenever you play the game, there's a random chance that you may or may not have access to specific areas. Mudtooth is located in an area called Mudtooth's Hideout, and it's very easy to identify because there is a large crashed helicopter. You can usually hear Mudtooth's area before you get to it because there's a radio playing as well. All you need to do to unlock the This Watch trophy is talk to Mudtooth and exhaust his dialogue. It's going to take a really long time because the old guy is full of stories. Just keep asking him to tell you more and eventually he will give you a pocket watch and you will get the This Watch trophy. The next trophy is called Precious, and to get Precious you have to return the Tarnished Ring to Reggie. Reggie is one of the merchants in Ward 13, and if you exhaust his dialogue he will tell you about a ring that he once had. This ring is a random spawn which will only appear on Earth. Reggie's ring is unique because it glows red instead of purple, and it's also stored under the Quest Items tab of your inventory. Once you've acquired the precious ring, you take it to Reggie and ask, is this your ring? When you do this, you're going to unlock the precious trophy as well as a trait called Scavenger. The Scavenger trait allows you to pick up more scrap than usual, and I would recommend maxing it out so that you can earn the Scrap Collector trophy as soon as possible. In my adventures on Earth, I found the Tarnished Ring once in the Overworld and once in a dungeon, so it is possible to spawn in either one. The next trophy is called Not So Lucky. To earn this trophy, you have to return the Strange Coin to Ace. Right across from Reggie in Ward 13, there is another merchant named Ace. Very similar to Reggie's storyline where he's lost this Tarnished Ring, Ace has lost a partner who has a Strange Coin. The Strange Coin was a really difficult spawn for me to find, in fact, I had to re-roll my game several times, I played through Adventure Mode probably three or four times, and Earth on the campaign at least four or five times before I was able to find this coin. When I finally did find it, it was in one of the sewer dungeons, and I'd like to give you a few general tips for scouring Earth for these two items. First of all, I believe, and I'm not 100% sure of this, but I strongly believe that only one of these two can spawn on any given playthrough. So if you're playing the game and you find the Tarnished Ring, don't expect to find the strange coin as well. I'd also recommend running through the Earth overworld areas as quickly as possible and not bothering to search through all the buildings. While the game is procedurally generated and I believe there is technically a chance that one of these items will spawn in one of the buildings, it's a whole lot faster to go through the dungeons and then re-roll your game if you have to. 
One more note about the dungeons is that each dungeon is going to spawn one blue Tome of Knowledge, and I believe only one rare item. So once you find a purple ring or amulet, that's probably going to seal the deal, and that means you're not going to find a strange coin or the tarnished ring inside that dungeon. The final two trophies in Earth each correspond to one of the two possible Earth bosses. So each time you roll your campaign or play through Earth on Adventure Mode, you will either deal with Singe the Dragon or the giant tree named the Ent. Each one of them has a trophy, and you're going to need to re-roll or play through an Adventure Mode at least one time to get to the other boss. Just like before, if you're playing with a friend, you can also join the friend's world, and when they kill the boss, you should get that trophy. The second world in the campaign is called Rome, and Rome has three possible trophies. Toward the end of Rome, you're going to get one of two possible world bosses. Only one of these two world bosses has a trophy associated with it, and that is the Clavager. When you kill the Clavager, you'll get the trophy called the Keymaster. And whether you have the Clavager or the other world boss, it doesn't matter. After that, you're going to be paying a visit to the Undying King. The Undying King says that if you take the heart of the creature of the next world and bring it back to him, that he will reward you. If you choose to accept the King's offer and you follow through with your promise, you will get a trophy called Shot Through the Heart. And if you either reject the King's offer outright or later on refuse to give him the heart, then the King will become hostile to you. Killing the Undying King will get you a trophy called Undying, eh? Unfortunately, those two trophies are mutually exclusive, meaning that you are going to have to re-roll Rome at least one time or play with a friend in order to obtain both trophies. It's also worth knowing that if you reject the King's offer outright and manage to kill him, that you will be given a key that can take you directly into the fourth world so you can skip the third world altogether if you like. But on your first playthrough, I wouldn't recommend doing that. I would recommend just accepting the King's offer and then giving him the heart later on. That's going to take you to the third world, which is called Corsus. Corsus only contains one trophy, and you get that trophy by defeating the final world boss of Corsus. Unlike Earth and Rome, there's only one possible world boss for this world, so if you play through all of Corsus and defeat the final boss, you will get the Butterfly Effect trophy. The fourth and final world of the base game of Remnant from the Ashes is called Yesha. This world contains three trophies. The first trophy is called Changing of the Guard, and you get this trophy by meeting the Pan Rebel Leader. The Pan Rebel Leader is in a location called Shrine of the Immortals, and you'll know you're in the right area when you enter through a fog gate and you are in the middle of a battlefield. Once the battle's over, all you need to do is speak to the leader, and this will unlock the Changing of the Guard trophy. The other two trophies on Yesha each correspond to one of the world bosses. Just like with Earth, there are two different trophies for two different world bosses, so you are going to need to play through Yesha on Adventure Mode or in a new campaign in order to get a chance to unlock the other boss. On the way to the boss area, if you have a totem on the left-hand side, then you have drawn the Totem Father boss. Defeating this boss will get you a trophy called Watch the Totems. And it's worth knowing that if you shoot the side of this totem, you can flip it around, and that's going to change the boss fight. The other possible world boss of Yesha is the Ravager. The Ravager is located inside the Ravager's Haunt, and defeating this boss gets you the Wolf of the Woods trophy. There are also two options for defeating this boss. The first option is to aggro the boss by shooting at him, and then you have a normal boss fight. The second option is to shoot the bells in a particular order, and as long as you shoot the bells in the correct order, within the time limit, the boss will be non-hostile toward you, and you can skip the fight altogether. I should also mention that this is a possible way to unlock the untouchable trophy, although that's not how I unlocked it. That's a perfect segue into our final section on trophies, and these are what I like to call the Anytime Trophies. These trophies can be unlocked at any time, and on any world, including in the DLC. I've just mentioned the first of these trophies, which is called Untouchable. To earn the Untouchable trophy, you have to defeat a world boss in offline mode without taking damage. You can defeat the Pan Wolf by ringing the bells, I wanted a bit more of a challenge than that, and I was kind of stuck on Earth going after this strange coin, so I decided to fight Singe. And getting this trophy is a lot easier than it sounds. It only took me three or four tries to unlock the trophy. I used a combination of the bleed damage from the Devastator, highly upgraded weapons, and Singe went down pretty easily. The next Anytime trophy is another one that I've already mentioned called Scrap Collector, and to earn this trophy you need to acquire 200,000 scrap. This takes a really long time and is probably going to be one of the last trophies that you unlock in this game. However, I do have a few strategies that will make this trophy a little bit less painful for you. When you return the Tarnished Ring to Reggie, you'll unlock a trait called Scavenger. 
If you upgrade this trait to the maximum level, you will significantly increase the amount of scrap that you pick up in the world. You can also get an extra 20% scrap just by having any one piece of the Adventurer's set equipped at any given time. For light armor, it's pretty good, and I found myself upgrading it and wearing it throughout most of the game. There's also a random event on Yesha that has an item called the Scavenger's Bobble. I've got a link in the description to a video that shows how to unlock this amulet. If you equip this amulet, the Adventurer armor, and max out the Scavenger trait, you'll end up picking up more than double the scrap off the ground. And I'd recommend doing all three of those throughout the majority of your playthrough to earn the Scrap Collector trophy as soon as possible. The next Anytime trophy is called Unleash Your Potential, and to get this trophy you need to acquire 30 traits. I'm not going to go through how to get every single trait in this video because that would make it way too long, but I will have a link down in the description to a webpage that tells you how to get lots of traits. If you have the DLC, getting 30 traits is going to be pretty easy and you can do all that in offline mode, but if you don't have the DLC packs, then there's a good chance you're going to have to play online for at least some of the traits. The Trait Focus Trophy is unlocked once you upgrade any of your traits to the maximum level. In this game, that's level 20. There are lots of really good traits in the game. I would recommend leveling up your Vigor or your Stamina initially. There's also a really good trait called Elder Knowledge that we're going to talk about later on in the video. And of course, there's the Scavenger trait that we've already mentioned a couple times. Just take any one of these to level 20 and you'll get the Trait Focus Trophy. You can earn the Push It to the Limit Trophy by upgrading any regular weapon to plus 20. This does not work for boss weapons because they can only be upgraded to plus 10. I would definitely caution against upgrading your weapon to plus 20 until your armor is leveled up as well. And that's just because of how the level scaling works. We're going to talk about that in the general strategy section toward the end of the video. The next trophy is called Like a Boss, and you can earn this trophy by upgrading a boss weapon to plus 5. Just like in the Dark Souls series, when you kill a boss, you can usually make a weapon out of one of their body parts. I really like the Devastator and the Defiler weapons, but the Spitfire was pretty good too. The next trophy is called Mod Enthusiast, and you get this by acquiring 15 different weapon mods. Most weapon mods can be purchased from McCabe in Ward 13, but some of the weapon mods, such as Very Good Boy, can be earned in the overworld. By the way, Very Good Boy gets my nod for my favorite weapon mod. Which weapon mod is your personal favorite? Let me know in the comments down below. The last trophy that is one of the Anytime trophies is called Equipment Enthusiast, and you earn this trophy by acquiring 10 armor sets. Just like with the traits, I'm not going to go through every possible armor set in the game, so I'm going to have a link in the description to a webpage you can use for reference. I am going to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the armor sets. When you choose your starting class, you're going to get one armor set unlocked right off the bat, and the armor sets for the other two starting classes that you didn't choose will be available from the merchant named Riggs in Ward 13. When you start the game, you're going to have two out of three pieces for the Adventurer set, and the third piece you can buy from Riggs with glowing fragment shards. Those are pretty hard to come by though, so I wouldn't count on getting that helmet unless you buy the DLC Swamps of Corsus. There are four pretty easy to acquire armor sets on Earth. These are the Drifter set, the Bandit set, the Twisted set, and Leto's armor. Rome has three fairly easy to acquire armor sets, the Osseus armor, the Akari armor, and the Void set. I'd strongly recommend picking up the Void Set armor because it's a really good armor set to have, and I've got a link to a video that shows you exactly how to obtain that armor set. Now let's move on to some general strategies for playing Remnant from the Ashes. At the beginning of the game, there are three classes to choose from. You've got the Hunter, the Warrior, and the Ex-Cultist. You can buy all of the mods and all of the weapons and the armor right here in Ward 13 for any of the classes, but you cannot buy the traits. The traits are going to be acquired randomly throughout the game, and I would recommend focusing on the traits and choosing the one that best fits your playstyle. Personally, I chose the Ex-Cultist class because it had Mender's Aura, but I believe that the starting trait is also the best, so I'm very happy with that choice. By the way, for early game weapons, the Coach Gun isn't too bad, but I did prefer the Hunting Rifle. Later on, I was lucky enough to find the Assault Rifle on Earth, and that's a really good weapon, as is the Beam Rifle. For short guns, I really liked the Spitfire SMG, but it wasn't very effective against a lot of the bosses, just because you had to get up close in order to burn them. And I found that the Defiler and the regular SMG were better general purpose weapons. For most boss battles, the hunting rifle was pretty good, but the Devastator was amazing. The Devastator does a high amount of bleed damage, and you only have to hit a single shot in order to have that damage over time buff. And even the regular shots from the Devastator do a huge amount of damage, 
When you first start out on Earth, you can get two pieces of the Drifter armor set pretty easily and for free, and you can also take the Founder's Keep card back into Ward 13 in order to get the Submachine Gun, the Elder Knowledge trait, and some other stuff. By the way, the Elder Knowledge trait is one that I would recommend leveling up as soon as possible because it will increase the rate at which you earn trait points and can level up your other traits. Check out the Things I Wish I Knew About Remnant Earlier video down in the description for more details. I have a few battle strategy tips for you as well. First off, don't be afraid to use your weapon mods. Most of them recover very quickly, and they recover more the more regular damage you do. So it's best to use your weapon mods early on in the fight, and they'll probably be recharged pretty quickly. Also, don't underestimate the power of the neutral dodge. The neutral dodge has a faster animation and a faster recovery time than regular rolling, and in general, it's just really, really good. When you're trying to figure out what to use to upgrade, it's really helpful to know how the game scales difficulty. This is explained by a Reddit post from one of the developers, but I'm gonna go ahead and summarize it here. You can find the full post and another link down in the description. Basically, when you enter an area, the game is going to go through and look at all of your armor and all of your weapons in every slot, and the single highest item is going to be used to set the difficulty level for the area you're in. This difficulty level is going to stick around until you re-roll, and this means you want to keep the weapons that you are currently using and the armor that you have equipped at about the same level at all times. If you don't do this, then either your armor or your weapons are going to suffer, and you're going to find yourself grinding and trying to upgrade whatever's underleveled in order to progress to the next area. So in other words, only upgrade what you use and try to upgrade everything at about the same pace. If you have any questions about this or anything else in the video, please let me know in the comments down below. You can also drop by and check out one of my Twitch streams. I do answer questions over there live on the air. If you think I did a pretty good job on this video and you learned something useful, then go ahead and hit the like button, and subscribe to the channel if you'd like to see more Platinum Trophy Guides from me in the future. And as always, thank you very much for watching. Whoa.